From Temple University, this is Profiles in Literature, featuring interviews with authors and illustrators prominent in American literature for children. The moderator for this series is Dr. Jacqueline N. Schachter, Professor of Children's Literature with Temple University. I have the pleasure of presenting the 1963 Newbery Medal winner, Madeline Langle. In private life, she is Mrs. Hugh Franklin, a resident of New York City. I'm also pleased to welcome to the studio Hugh Franklin, her husband, seated in the front row, who is a celebrity in his own right, starring on the television series, All My Children. While A Wrinkle in Time brought Madeleine Lengel the Newbery Medal, her volume, Meet the Austins, was on the 1960 Notable Children's Book List of the American Library Association. And in 1969, she won the Austrian State Prize for The Moon by Night. She was the first non-Austrian, incidentally, to win that prize. Ms. Lengel, would you care to tell us something about these awards or any other awards that you've received? Well, the, the Austrian one was perhaps the most fun because it was required that I go to Austria to receive it. So I joined the jet set and went to Vienna for the weekend. It really was the weekend. I arrived Friday night and left Tuesday morning. At also, I was told that since I was an American, of course, I would be excused the usual acceptance speech. Well, I wasn't about to let America down. <laughs> I had college German, which practically flunked me out of college, but uh, I went to a German friend and presented my speech written in English, and she translated it for me. So uh, I gave an acceptance speech in Vienna in German, as usual, tripping over the mic on my way up and everything, and with my appalling German pronunciation. But uh, they really appreciated the fact that I said thank you in their own language. Right. Uh, I want to now present the members of this panel. My distinguished colleagues, Dr. Miriam Wilt and Dr. Ann Roos, who are specialists in the field of children's literature, and three very capable students, Mrs. Brenda Flowers and Miss Ruby Perkins, who, like a portion of the students in the uh, audience, are members of the Triple T program, that is, Trainers of Teachers of Teachers a doctoral program here at Temple. And last but not least, Mrs. Linda No. She is the reading teacher at Welsh Elementary, where the other portion of the audience comes from, for they are in an in-service course, learning reading methods as well as materials. I'm going to break the ice by leading off, and then I invite the members of the panel and the people in the audience to raise your hand and ask the bulk of the questions. I noticed in reading your books that one or both of these ideas seem to be contained in, all, in most of them. The first is emphasis on creativity against standardization and regimentation. And the second is stress on love versus greed of power seekers, or the teddy bear versus the spider in the arm of the starfish. I, I would wish that you would uh, expound on these ideas. Well, uh, I think probably every writer, and every artist, and every musician has a theme. And what we do is, is go over it over and over again. I mean, you can always recognize a concerto of Rachmaninoff or a fugue by Bach because they had their own thing to say. And I think you're right about what my thing is, and that is the particular versus the general. That you are not just a general audience of people there. You are each a particular individual person. Or you know, we're, we're completely lost. Um, I'd like to give one example of this because I think it's the, the greatest menace to uh, our country and to art in, in general today. And this is that uh, a summer ago, I was paying a grocery bill. And 
My husband was in New York, and I paid it on an old check that didn't have the cybernetic salad in the bottom left-hand corner. And it bounced. And I didn't know why it bounced. And I was finally told it bounced because it didn't have that cybernetic magnetic gibberish in the bottom left-hand corner. And I was very, very angry. And I was angry so loudly at the dinner table that my husband had to bang on it and yell, shut up, which I better not do because of the mic. But I thought about this for a long, long time. At, at Christmas, a friend of ours bought something for me for $10.50, and I went to pay him back. And I have Scotch blood, and I have French Huguenot blood, and I had a whole book of those checks left, and I saw no reason to waste them. I mean, I was taught that if I have the money in the bank and my name, my signature, my me, this is what matters. So I pulled out one of these checks. Well, he's, his business is to handle enormous sums of money every day. He knows what he's talking about. And he said, come off it, Madeline. You know that check won't go through. I said, Dan, do you really mean to tell me that my name means absolutely nothing? And he said, yes. Well, it was a perfectly awful, gray, windy, rainy day out. And I said, OK, I feel like Emily Bronte today. <laughs> and I took out a check with that magnetic junk in the bottom left-hand corner. And I signed in the right-hand side, Emily Bronte. And he was not amused. <laughs> I said, all right, Dan, so if my name means nothing, go along with me. Let's see what happens. He said, I won't get my money. I said, well, find out. So he came in after lunch with his money, looking a bit sheepish. And he said, well, it won't go through. It won't come through on your account. Well, I now have canceled checks signed Emily Bronte, <laughs> Jane Austen, and Elizabeth Barrett Brown. <laughs> and I think this is really what I'm writing about. <laughs> to, to save each individual human being, that, that every person is valuable as a person, not as a member of a group or a cause or a party, but as, as persons. And uh, in art in general, you don't write about general characters. You write about particular people. I'm answering you at much greater length than you expected. No, no, Sorry. no. This, these are the heart, the theme. It's, it's like the little boy who got the book out about butterflies and took it back to the library, and the library and asked him what he thought. He said, I learned more about butterflies than I wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Do you want to speak to the second point, the, the love? issue. Well, you, you can't, you, you can't love generalities. You love people. And uh, this, again, is what... Uh, well, no, I can, see, you've got me on my thing. You better stop me. No, <laughs> no, because I found in your books the most beautiful expression of uh, friendship between several women uh, that I have found in children's books. I found that in the relationship of Manya to Julia Forrester, uh, the relationship of... Um, uh, Aunt Elena to Victoria Austin, and the aborted uh, friendship between Catherine Forrester and Sarah uh, Cressmont, is that her last name? Courtmont, I Courtmont, think. Courtmont, Courtmont. Um, you may wish to speak even of that point, and then I'm going to defer to Well, uh, I do think, again, in, in this great rush for generalities today, that we are forgetting what friendship is. And without my friends, I, I couldn't exist. I mean, they just dragged me through everything. But Madison Avenue, Madison Avenue is my scapegoat. I, I'm frankly convinced that it's run by the powers of darkness, that he sits there behind a great large desk with his little horns and his tail, running the whole thing. Because Madison Avenue wants people to buy the product. The less particular you are, and the less able to think for yourself, the more of the product you'll buy. So Madison Avenue has taken an excellent four-letter word, love, and made it into a three-letter word, sex. So if two men like each other, immediately they're fags. If two women like each other, they're lesbians. We, we're losing friendship. And friendship is a thing that happens between particular human beings who get excited together, who like to eat meals together, or simply sit in silence together, and it's what makes the world go round. Beautiful answer. Your turn, panel, and I can see people are anxious. Dr. Wilt, we better get you in because you are so sh shy. Well, no, I, I want to say, though, that uh, this person that has just been talking to you, to me, is one of the most creative and imaginative people I've ever read and known. I dearly love what she writes, so anything I say will be colored by this love of it. Uh, 
quite unafraid to express what is ugly and mean, you co I come through the experience searching for the good and hopeful that there's good everywhere. And I don't know, this isn't even going to be a question, I guess. Talk about a little bit about the good and evil and how you can take us through all the evil things and we come out at the end feeling very, very good about the way things could be, I guess. Uh, that's a very difficult one you've thrown at me. <laughs> I, I suppose I think it, it sort of adds on to what I was saying before about friendship. If you say to somebody, I'm willing to be your friend, then you open yourself up, you know, you're vulnerable, you can be stabbed. If you won't be a friend, you're protected, nobody can hurt you. If you're going to make yourself vulnerable and say to somebody, I'll be your friend, you're going to get hurt, this happens. And I suppose this too is what I write about, that people who make themselves vulnerable get hurt, and then what do you do? You can either be destroyed as a person, or you lick your wounds, you pull yourself back up onto your feet, and, and you go out and say, but I want to be your friend again. And this to me is one of the most impressive things about the young people that I work with and who write to me today. That I, I think they're sick and tired of our scrambling for security. And even though they don't always do it the right way, they are really beginning to be willing to be vulnerable, to say, here I am, take me. And that does mean you're going to get hurt. There isn't any way out of it. Um, if I could just give one example, during the Second World War, there was a, a young English war bride, and her husband was in the RAF, and they had three little babies, and he came home on leave, and she got all of their uh, food coupons together and went off, leaving him with the kids to buy the greatest meal you could possibly buy in wartime London, which wasn't going to be very great, but still it was going to be a, a party. And she was in, standing in line for a long time, and when she got home, a random bomb had dropped the house was gone, so were her husband and children. And she spent the rest of the war working with other homeless people, and she was very brave and much admired. And then somebody else fell in love with her and wanted to marry her. And she knew that as long as she didn't love again, as long as she didn't marry again or have children again, she was safe. She couldn't be hurt. If she married again, she loved again, had babies, then she was open once more to exactly the same kind of hurt that she'd had before. Well, she, she made the, the choice for life, and she married and had children. But as, as long as we face that, that when we love, it's going to be, it can be the most glorious thing in the world, but it also can be the most terrible. And this is a risk we have got to take, I think, otherwise we die. Camilla was my last experience. I just got around the reading it. And this is a more practical question. Why was it republished and the name changed? Well, it was republished because while I was off somewhere, my agent got the idea that it might be republished. As a, it was written as a, as a grown-up's book. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he thought it might work for a young adult book. And the only reason the name was changed was that the publishers wanted to change the name. I made very few changes in it. I took out two small sex scenes, which were not necessary, absolutely. And I took them out, not because I thought they would bother any of the kids who would read it, but that some little kids would read it, and they didn't really need that. And um, it might bother some grown-ups. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, you just made a little phrase that, that uh, hit me. You said, I took it out because little children didn't need it. And I'm wondering if, how you feel about the modern trend in children's literature to tell it as it is. Uh, do you have any reaction to the books that are, are coming out? And, and I won't mention them if you know what, one I'm, what ones I'm talking about. Uh, well, I have a vague idea, and I sort of have two things to, to uh, say. First of all, I don't think there is any subject which is in itself taboo at any age level. But I do think how it is handled is what makes the difference. And secondly, I'll simply give an analogy. When our children were three years old, we did not offer them martinis before dinner. There is a right time. 
I think I was also referring to the ones that the books that are very uh, I find very depressing where there is nothing good that happens to anyone in the book and these are for small children uh, maybe I'm a Pollyanna I will plead guilty to this but I wondered yours are so different yours are so full of hope uh, that things will be better even though you do tell things the way they are you still leave us uh, a little pinpoint of hope there anyway and I wondered if you had read any of the ones that do not leave any hope I've, I've read one or two and I think it's simply a basic point of view about life on the on the part of the author that there are people today who look at the world around us and we live on the upper west side of New York City uh, if you want to really live in a place where you could be depressed about the state of the world there it is uh, I can't live that way I think as long as as one person I, I don't want to be it's, it's not that I want to be sentimental because sentimentality always involves lying it, it's not quite truthful but even when you look at all of the very very bad things as long as there's a baby born who can laugh or if i go to bed at night furious at my husband and we make up before we go to bed okay that's enough i'll 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 go on that there's a ray of hope huh? <laughs> thank you but it isn't a sentimental ray no, of hope it's no, a realistic that's right one. a realistic living thing. in the world as it is today but it, the, the, when you take all hope away, you might just as well dig a hole and climb in. That's right. Thank you. Brenda, come on. Yes. Speak up. Well, allow me to begin by saying that I've enjoyed each of, your, each of your books that I've read. And I'd like to ask you about one book in particular. Uh, Mr. Franklin, in his biographical notes to your um, Newbery Award acceptance speech, stated that along with your successes, you had had a number of rejections. Oh, yeah. And strangely <laughs> enough, among them, the award-winning A Wrinkle in Time. Would you care to say why it was rejected, and if later, when it was published, the publisher was the one who re originally rejected it? Well, um, Good meet the, well, I, I went through a whole decade uh, in which I couldn't sell anything. And at that time, believe it or not, I was too realistic. <laughs> um, Meet the Austins was rejected over and over again because it begins with a death. And at that time, children were not supposed to allow that death exists. Well, death does exist. And it was Toynbee who said, we're a sick society because we refuse to accept death in infinity. Well, I'd seen my children accept death. And children are far more realistic about it than grown-ups are. It was only grown-ups who were bothered by, by it in the book. A Wrinkle in Time was rejected, oh dear, I, I can't tell you how many times, uh, for two reasons mostly. One was uh, quite a lot of publishers didn't know whether it was for children or grown-ups. Then the other reason was that it dealt too overtly with the problem of evil. It showed children that there was evil in the world. Well, there is evil in the world, and we've got to fight it. And if you protect children entirely from the fact that there is death, that there is evil, that there are people who hate, that there are people who would like to hurt them, they have no weapons and they're going to grow up incapable of loving. You cannot love truly, maturely in an unreal world that doesn't deal with all of these things. So um, we've sort of gone to the other end of the pendulum. Now we have realism without love. <laughs> Does that answer it? Also, I might add that, uh, like every other author, when I got a rejection slip, I bled. I bled all over the living room rug for 24 hours. <laughs> Do you know that Arbuthnot, the dean of all critics of children's literature, says that your book, Meet the Austins, is the first book since Little Women that deals well with death? Oh, that's marvelous. I think so. <laughs> Ruth, do you have... I'd like to preface my question by saying that in the first two books that I read, Meet the Austins and um, The Moon by Night, you uh, show the story through a particular character, usually the protagonist. And this kind of uh, ensures the reader that he, will, he or she will travel along with the character and kind of hope for good fortune for the character. Then in the next books that I come to, A Wrinkle in Time, The Arm of the Starfish, and um, The Young Unicorns, you tell it through the 
objective outside point of view. Now my question is, what dictates the point of view a story will take for you? Um, I'll answer that in two sections, if I may. Uh, first of all, I'm not that objective in using the third person in those three books, because uh, in the arm of the starfish, the narrator, me, doesn't know anything that Adam doesn't know. And um, the, the same thing is true, what was the... Uh, the young, young unicorns. In the young unicorns, Josh. I do move from point of view to point of view. But when I'm speaking as, as uh, Josiah Davidson, I don't know anything that he doesn't know. When I'm speaking as Emily or Vicky, I don't know anything that they don't know. It, it just gives me a little bit more freedom. Um, and as to why uh, I did it, I, I didn't, well, I'll go back to an exam I had in Chaucer in college. Uh, we were asked on the final exam why Chaucer had done this and why he'd done that and why he did the other. And in great righteous indignation, I wrote, I don't think Chaucer knew why he did any of these things. That isn't the way people write. I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's enough. Yeah, it just happened. And that's the way the book sort of wanted to be done. That's, I like it. Uh, a, a, a book... Um, a book tells me, oh, another example that, that you might sort of like is that in the arm of the starfish, Adam wakes up after terrible experiences in the Ritz Hotel in Lisbon. And there in a chair, sitting calmly and watching him, is a young man named Joshua. Now, I had no idea whatsoever that when Adam woke up that there would be a young man, man named Joshua there. I don't know how he got there. He made me rewrite the entire book. It, it's a better book because of Joshua but I can't possibly explain where he came from. He was simply there. There was another death, too, Madeline. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. yes. A terrible, yes. tragic oh, my, moment. My son, who um, was, oh, maybe 10 when I was writing that, I was reading it aloud to the kids as I wrote it, which I have often done. He has never forgiven me for Joshua's death. In mm. fact, it was a long while before he would read anything else I wrote. He was so furious. <laughs> I said, but I didn't want him to die either. It just happened. I mean, he got shot. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, it's your turn. Your books have such a personal strain it sometimes. Were any of your own children the inspiration for any of your characters? That's a nice question, because I like to answer that one. Uh, I never deliberately write about anybody that I know, because if you write about somebody you know, you're, you're limited by that person. You really can't write anything that you don't know about that mm -hmm. person, and that means that you can't have things like Joshua yeah. arriving. Now, there are two exceptions to that, and one is the Rob Austin character, and that simply is our youngest child, and I couldn't keep him out. There he is. It, that's who it is. And then the other one is the Canon Talis character mm -hmm. in both Starfish and the Young Unicorns, and I certainly had no intention of allowing him in the book. <laughs> uh, but those, as far as I know, are the only two exceptions. However, I don't, I don't think you can ever wholly make up a character. Even if you're not conscious, you're obviously drawing on all the people you've ever met. And there's always got to be one character with whom I particularly identify. So f sort of further to answer your question, when it's in the first person, that's usually who it is. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm Vicky. In uh, Meet the Austins, I'm Meg, I was bad at school, I had braces on my teeth, I fell over furniture, you know, all, all that kind of thing. In um, Starfish, I sort of identified with, with uh, Adam and Polly, but there's always got to be sort of a me, and it's usually somebody gawky and clumsy and a very slow developer. <laughs> <laughs> Not mentally. All of your characters are generally on the gifted oh, side. Oh, I'm even younger than I was. <laughs> That's one of the advantages of writing fiction. <laughs> Would you find that most of your readers, judging from correspondence, are also on the gifted side? No. Um, the, the letters vary a great deal. Some of them are from very, very gifted children, but I think one of the most moving batches of letters I ever had was from a grade of retarded children who'd had a wrinkle in time read to them. And what they, the teacher apologized for their writing, but she, they knew and she had brought out in them the capacity to express love. I was just you know, torn apart by those letters. They were beautiful. What age? 
This is even more extraordinary second grade. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's extraordinary because you wouldn't usually think about wrinkle in time being for normal no. second grade. Children. I don't think it is for a normal second no. grader. Maybe but maybe this is it. I yeah. don't really think that any anything I've read of yours, you could say this is for a six year old or this is for a seventy year old. Uh, in Dance in the Desert, you know, you pick it up, you say it's a child's book. Well, it's no more a child's book than, mm -hmm. I don't know why. <laughs> it's, it's, but it's, so, it's so wonderfully beautiful for all ages. Well, you, you've given me a marvelous opening here, because if you want to make, I suppose, the blood pressure of, of almost anybody who's ever taught children's literature, and certainly anybody who's ever written a children's book, is to assume somehow that it's inferior to a book for grown-ups. That you, if you can't make it for grown-ups, write for kiddies, it's easier, chaps. Well, it isn't. And if a book you write for any child isn't worth your reading when you're 40 and 50 and 60, it isn't worth the child's reading mm -hmm. ever. And I never write with any age level in mind. I write a book. And uh, I'm glad that I have a, a body of adult novels too but i don't approach them any differently it's just simply the book which happens to be written and on quite a few of them the publisher has had to make an arbitrary decision as to whether it should be marketed as a trade book mm -hmm. or as a children's book and uh, you know there really should not be a difference mm -hmm. but your correspondence indicates again the importance of reading aloud yes books to children. I hope we have time to get in a question from the floor. How about you, Richard? Would you give us your question now, and then we'll have time for more questions in the next part. Well, something that I wanted to know, in the book of the young unicorns, a part when Dave was going to get, I forget her name, but she was the girl that was blind. And Emily. Story, Emily. Um, the boys that were after him, well, not really after him in the, as the, in the story. Well, were they were like were they part of the Alphabet's gang? Yes. Thank you. Now, the the reason that they were alphabets, um, they used letters of the alphabet instead of names, because uh, most of them had been on what was the equivalent of hard drugs, and they were nameless. They'd lost themselves as persons, and that's why none of them has a name. Does anyone else in the audience have a question related to the young unicorns now that Richard raised his Charles? Yes, I, I've gotten so used to reading urban education in the past few years that when I picked up the young unicorns, I automatically assumed that the young unicorns were the gang. And it didn't occur to me until days after I had read it that they weren't the gang. And yet, now I'm not sure they weren't the gang. Would you talk about Your which title. people... Mm -hmm. uh, were incorporated in the young unicorns and why you chose the unicorn as a symbol of them. <laughs> well, if you remember in the very beginning, there's the apocryphal writings of St. Macrina. Well, they're very apocryphal. I wrote it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that um, a unicorn cannot be coerced into becoming tame. He has to be tamed of his own free will. Well, I think for me, this was Emily, it was the Austins, it was Dave, who were capable of learning the freedom which comes with structure. I mean, if I want to climb up to the third story of our house, I've got to climb on a ladder. I can't get up otherwise. But, so the unicorn was, is my symbol of the structure which liberates, not the imprisoning structure. Uh, I was teaching a, a creative writing class down at a general theological seminary in New York, and one evening I went in knowing I was going to infuriate the boys and said, tonight we were going to talk about structure. And, you know, they were against structure. They wanted to be free to dance and to make love. <laughs> so I began asking them questions about what it was that made them free to dance and to make love. And, you know, finally one of them unwillingly brought out the skeleton, the structure. Because without our structure, we, we know, we're nothing but an amorphous blob of flesh, completely unable to dance and make love. Look at the amoeba. It doesn't have much fun. <laughs> it doesn't have any structure, right? Anybody else who wants to uh, ask a question now? Feel free. All right. Dr. Ruth, then go I ahead. I have one more. Fine. Uh, 
this is something that people, I guess, always ask authors, and so I'm not going to let this go by without asking you, which is your favorite book? <laughs> That is like asking a mother which is her favorite <laughs> child. <laughs> same answer, same question. Huh? <laughs> I think usually, you know, the, the one you're working on at the moment. Yes. I want to thank you very much, Madeline Langle. This time has gone by so quickly, and there will be other questions that people can ask privately of you afterwards, I hope. <laughs>